I think Sam would be a bad storyteller. He's like, sometimes- I like, I like, like the bad stories. He's like, it's the bee, fun. the mama bee is burying you in a dirt coffin and you, <laughs> you might tell. not be able to come like up. It. We've covered episodes here on Flock on native bees versus honeybees, techniques for attracting wildlife to your backyard, specialist pollinators and specialist pollinator plants. But today we're paying a visit to wildlife biologist, Sam Drogi to have an extensive conversation on taking a nature first approach to constructing and landscaping for wildlife and specifically to attract our dwindling native specialist bee populations. I'm Sam Drogi. I work at the Native Bee Lab or the Interagency Bee Lab because we now have several different groups there. We're here at my home. My home is a old house built in the 1920s, had about an acre, all lawn, very ordinary. <laughs> and I flipped it both because I use this as research, so I'm interested in what plants are blooming and what bees are coming to them, and because I'm compelled to do that. Mm. So the buildings have been altered a lot with natural home building kinds of approaches. There's a, an additional new building over there, new being, you know, uh, 2010 or so all out of straw bales and different kinds of techniques and things you can get from the earth and um, can go back to the earth pretty easily and be repaired by digging a hole in the backyard, that kind of thing. And I want to be surrounded by nature at lots of levels. So the general idea here is that you have surrounding is the Patuxent River bottomlands and it comes up to the edge of my house because that's mm -hmm. the boundary with state land or something. And what I want to do is I want to merge with that. Yeah, so you just want to like be seamless. Yes, yeah. particularly ar around the edges. So with the, like a lot of people, right, you use the area near your house the most. Mm -hmm. And what you want to have, I think, in a nature first sort of approach to everything is to have the um, landscape nearest the area that is most natural be the wildest mm -hmm. instead of like a lot of times you might see this, okay, I've got a house and I've got a big lawn and I'm interested in pollinators and now I'm gonna put a big round circle of pollinator meadow mm -hmm. in the middle, mm -hmm. but it's not connected. And right. so the animals look at that and go, no, I don't think so. There's a lot of dangerous area between that pollinator garden and the woods. Now others, like bees don't care, they just mm -hmm. fly wherever. But a lot of the other animals are going to avoid that. So here, not necessarily what most people would want, I've got all kinds of cool snakes and other things. And I skinks. also love snakes. I'm like, I'm like, let's put some more stones out for yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, so like I'm saving these old roofing panels yeah, over here. Yeah, walk over? So these, we're replacing the roof on this house. Up oh, and there's our temple bell it's made of a, an old. It's not our dinner bell yet. <laughs> no, but it's made from an old, um, I think oh, it's CO2. Like a, yeah, I was gonna uh, say CO2 or maybe it had some kind of gas in it or yeah, something. Yeah, it was CO2 and made me a lot less uh, worried about cutting into it with a grinder. <laughs> and then, oh, they make great bells. I mean, yeah. they're very thick, that's the thing. So you want a cylinder that's very thick, not some of these flimsy ones. Not that we're talking about that. No, so here, so here, this is for the skinks and the snakes? Yeah, so anyway, these just came off the roof. We replace that uh, this year. Yeah, you said red roof, and I was like, it looks silver to me. <laughs> I, it was red. See, there is there is the old, this is Andorra roofing, which is made from a, a fiber impregnated with tar. Oh, crazy. Um, it was a great look. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that eventually, it after breaks 20 down. years, it breaks down. And boy, did it go fast. So I'm not sure what was going on, but mm -hmm. it went quickly. Anyway, if you put these out like any roofing panel out in the woods on the forest floor, every uh, little mouse and snake and all kinds of things go under there and then you can just lift it up and see what's going on. Yeah. Anything that is in an environment that is friendly to animals um, will have snakes, which we like. Yeah. Other people maybe not so much and they don't have to do this, but things like uh, big flagstones and uh, roofing panels, old boards, plywood, all kinds of things. And that's what the snakeheads do when they are um, interested in studying snakes. They just put out lots of basically flat junk and then they go and look under them. Now here, sadly, we don't have things like copperheads and rattlesnakes, but we do have hognose snake, king snake, 
Rat snakes, and probably. We have rat snake yeah. and racers. Milks, and milk snakes. Mm, no? No, it might be around, yeah. but I don't, have never seen any. Okay. We have worm snakes. Oh, worm snakes are pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and um, garter snakes and um, probably in the swamp, there's things like queen snakes. And so you're, you're kind of like the bee guy, but you like all of nature and oh, yeah, you just want to facilitate always, yeah. that in yeah. your own house. Right, and through different periods of my profession, I've worked on amphibians and birds and butterflies, everything. Are you, you leaving some of this shrubby? You have like a lot of hedges for the, yeah. example, for the birds? It's or? very, it's often in flux. So mm -hmm. I may just completely wipe out some of these things and mm -hmm. redo it, replant things, but you can't really tell what's going on here. But for example, that's uh, aronia, the black one, whatever that is. Yeah, what is the, that, chokeberry? The Melanocarpa? Yes. Aronia Melanocarpa? Yeah, so that's black chokeberry, I believe is a common name. Uh, do you have a deer? pressure here? Um, n yes and no. Okay. So we're surrounded by a lot of deer. But when they come into the yard, they often don't leave the yard. Uh -huh. and they go in my freezer. Uh <laughs> so I see. If you want, I, I can show Because I was like, your aronia is not eaten. <laughs> I know. Well, actually, it, it's aronia. super effective. So what people don't really realize is that um, it's not like um, a this mass of, of deer populations are just roaming around randomly. <clears throat> always targeting your garden, there's a set of females that basically have territories yeah, and their female know. daughter yeah. sets up the territory. So if you eliminate those, you know, even though the population is high, you can really drop the numbers. And that totally works. I see them every once in a while, but some deer pressure is okay. Yeah. It's just the, I'm gonna park my deer butt in <laughs> your garden or my garden and eat everything is a problem. Yeah. But on the other hand, organic, you know, natural. It's led a great life. Um, good food replaces other things I would have to buy. Not that I buy meat. So it works out really well. Yeah. Now when you take out the mother deer or that kind of t claims this territory, mm -hmm. will that hole be filled by another deer? Kind eventually, of okay. eventually, but it's very slow. Yeah. So it's, there's, you would think it'd be a lot faster. Like if I go out in the woods in the winter and it's snowed, there are like a billion tracks over there. Mm -hmm. And so they they have, you know, free reign to come in, but they don't and are not very commonly. So um, I really have no no significant deer problem. Yeah. And I notice you're like leaving a lot of these stumps up too. Yeah. You've planted into it as well. Right. But this yeah. is also providing like a nature resor uh, reservoir. Oh, for... there's so much, you yeah. know. Um, you can see that the pileata woodpeckers have gone in there to mm -hmm. get the best bugs and other of the beetles. This has been down for over 10 years. I mean, you can almost see this actually turning into soil. Yeah, <laughs> right yeah, yeah. There it is. Before it your is. own eyes, you know. Yeah, and it's growing a whole series of different kinds of plants, some on their own. And yes, I put the prickly pear, yeah. <laughs> which is underrated and likes sort of tough environments. And the tree I have out front that's fallen down now is going to be a giant prickly pear garden. And so sedums are really natural for this after either you have to carve into it and put some, a little bit of soil in, mm -hmm. or when it goes into initial rot as a, you know, if you wanted to, you could really have way much fun with this in terms of the plants and the aspects mm -hmm. and the creativity. But it's also just full of life. Yeah. And th all those particular creatures are creatures that need rotting wood. And if you clean it all up, they're gone. Now, would you see any bees utilizing this? Because it is kind of like um, sandy, I guess, in a way, or um, not so much? I have not okay. um, seen it, but um, there are a set of bees, maybe four or five species that are um, bees that nest in rotting wood. Mm. So um, they don't have common names, really. Lazy Glossium ceruleum, so mm. it's a beautiful, beautiful blue. Beautiful blue, yeah. Yes. And Four or five others. Oh, there, there's one now. Oh no, there was, was a it green, green one. Yeah, it was green. I was yeah. going to say Algochlora pura <laughs> okay. is the is very common, and that's exactly um, bring them out the place. <laughs> so if we were to like tear that open, which yeah. we were not going to do, almost certainly there'd be Algochlora pura nesting in there. Yeah, and in fact they overwintered, so we're probably seeing the initial wake up of that group. Yeah, and, and this, this spring has bee. come a little bit early. And, oh my God, and I know we're here a little bit before like the blooms, so yeah. we're not gonna see any of that in, in right, Sam's right. yard, but 
you, I have just started to see like the first signs of bees, like where we are too, yeah. so. Well, and so here, they'll be out in late February mm -hmm. if there's any kind of like over 60 degree day. And the MO there is, there's a few plants um, around that are mostly trees. So like salix and stuff like that. They get not, not quite yet. yet. Okay. Um, Pussy willow would be the, maybe the only one that mm. would be out of that salix spread. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of willows. Willows are like a keystone for a set of species, eight to 12 specialist bees only on willow. No willow, those bees are no gone. Yes, no but the species. earliest thing is actually red maple and uh, yeah. maybe other couple other trees. And so the system is works for both things. So like for red maple, it's like, I'm gonna do a little windblown pollination. I'm gonna produce a tiny bit of nectar and some pollen. And then for the bees, they are coming out when it's 60 degrees, going up and grabbing the pollen and bringing it back. And when it gets cold again, which it inevitably does at this time of year, they're like done. Hmm. So they just stay in the hole and wait for the next warm day. Now let's define a specialist pollinator because we have defined it on our episodes, but for people who haven't seen those episodes, why don't you describe sure. and define Yeah, the well you could define it many different ways. So there are some bees that do one-on-one. -on -one. So for example, um, pickerel weed, which up here there's only one species. You have to go, I think, to South America to get another one. Hmm. So that's that plant pontidaria that that's comes in the out middle. of the marshy area. Like yeah, way pond. out in the water, yeah. actually. It's yeah. not even near. And it puts up that giant purple spike, which says, I want a pollinator to fly across to the water and pollinate me, and you're not going to find a place to nest here, but I have to have a super signal. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing is, it, not to go down the Pontidaria rabbit hole, but they have very, very specialized um, pollen and nectar cavities. You have to have a very long tongue to get to them. You have to have hooks on the hairs on the tip of your tongue to pull the pollen out, and very few species do that. It must be a really good and you reward. You have to go way out there. <laughs> well, for three species yeah. of three different genera, it's the only reward. Mm. Like no Pontidaria, those no, species those are bees, gone. Yeah. Um, fortunately, it's a pretty stable plant. You know, it's in a lot of the tidal rivers here, and so we can still find. In fact. We have now found all three again. They were found a uh, hundred years ago, and then they're like, I wonder if they're still here. But we did enough work. You have to actually go to these big populations, which yeah. means in a boat. Yeah, I'm encouraged by seeing some of the research to incorporate some of the specialist pollinator plants right, right. in the landscape. But how do they find them? How do they come back? Can they come back? How long does it take for them to come back? I know those are probably all generic questions, right, right. but like, like, and well, how, how much of a population of that plant do you need to have? Like, if we were to take our pond and say, okay, we're going to get some Pontidaria, yeah, yeah. are we going to get any pollinators or not? You know what I mean? Um, like, well, it kind of depends. So you're up near the Finger Lakes, yeah. but um, not terribly far up towards the Lake Plain. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure all of the configurations there is um, a Fish and Wildlife Service refuge mm -hmm. that is called... Uh, I don't know, actually. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's got... As the, most of these refuges, sort of a duck place, right? So they got tons of. Well, Sapsucker of, Woods is like filled with like a, is like a duck place. That might be too, but yeah. this one has that. So people have done some surveys up there for um, bees, and mm -hmm. they have found the Pontidaria specialists up there. So you're not impossibly far, but you would find these bees where there are big populations of yeah. Pontidaria, and then it would be just a distance thing. So, for example. Um, when a bee comes out of the ground, it's the its mom is dead, sadly, mm -hmm. from died last year, has no information. So if it doesn't see in the immediate area any of its plant, I see. it just starts flying. And Fly, it will yeah. fly until it finds it or it's dead. Oh, um, so, gosh, it's so tragic. Nature's tragic. Oh, uh, <laughs> wow. I mean, you're projecting, Sometimes. of yeah, course. But I am. The, um, <laughs> but, you know, in most cases, it came out of a nest for a reason that the plant was there. Was there, the mom put it there, you know, yeah. unless, she, unless she secretly hated her babies. But. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that could be not, but the um, idea is the same, or really the reality is that put it in, it was there, and yeah. then someone scraped it all off right. and put something else in. So, Because um, I, I, I asked this question because where we had moved to, mm -hmm. the person before us like really loved like rare conifers and Japanese maples, which mm. I think were not necessarily our specialist pollinator plants. 
And probably not. No, and and so we kind of let things particularly the conifers. Yeah, <laughs> so we so we kind of let things grow out. Yeah, and um, started to put in a lot more plants. Uh -huh. And I was like, you know, we didn't see uh, fireflies. We didn't see many pollinators. Mm. And then that changed. And I'm like, how do they? Find yeah, like yeah. how do they find it? Like they're it's just coursing, like, you know they're so, coursing all over the place, yeah. dispersing. So there's a difference between dispersing, like from the nest to something mm -hmm. that can be miles, miles and miles. So a couple examples. I have colleagues who work in the West where there are also lots of cool bees, and there's these big flat salt lakes. You know, it's just a salt pan. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no plants there. And they can go five miles out into those salt lakes and put out little traps that are attractive to bees. They get them. Wow. Because the bees are not like that smart, you know, like, oh, don't go out on a salt lake. <laughs> and they are flying and maybe they'll make it across. Yeah. But they see that color, which is, it's a color-based trap. It's like, oh, a flower. I'm going to check it out. So um, same thing here. We did a parking lot a mile uh, long by a half mile wide. Nothing, not even a crack with weeds in it. Middle of that, we got plenty of bees in those hmm. traps because they were traveling yeah. across them. Well, that's, I mean, that's really hopeful. It's, yeah. uh, you know, to, no, no, no. to you kind should, of hear those stories. You should not limit yourself. Yeah. And then out of curiosity, and this might be very general, if you were to replant a population of, like, say, specialist pollinator uh -huh. plants, how many would you need to sustain a little, a little bee population? Right. So um, I got this from Brian Danforth, who's mm -hmm. up at um, Ithaca. And basically, In our area. yes, yeah. and he um, did a review of um, that subject. Mm -hmm. And basically it comes down to something, let's say five flowers worth of pollen and nectar. So that's almost nothing. Yeah, for what a baby bee. Yes, so yes, okay. that's, so that and would And then I think I enough. read that same report because I think I had mentioned that in my like mm -hmm. specialist pollinator video because I was like, five flowers for one little baby bee. <laughs> right, well, if you think about it, they're small, first yes. of all. Yeah. And also they're exothermic, so they're not, they don't have to like create heat and they live mostly underground. Mm -hmm. So if you're living underground, like it would be very difficult for you to have your mom put you in a cave and then bury you alive for <laughs> months at a time. Yeah. Like, you probably wouldn't make it out. Right. So, but for them, it's no big deal. Yeah. You know, essentially the, all the tunnels and everything collapse and they have to dig their way out. They're fine hmm. because they need so little oxygen and so little, you know, in general, let's just call it energy to get going. So it doesn't take much food to create one. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the world as a whole, there's tons of flowers. Right? Yeah. Well, especially if you take like something like symphiotrike, like an aster, yeah. which has like inflorescence everywhere. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Which is also Liatris. full of chemicals that um, most bees hate. That's why it has highly specialized bees. Oh, that's interesting. In it. So it's like a chem like a pheromone almost, or just like um, chemistry. It's straight that chemical. Just, okay. Yeah. So um, the apparently the story would be that the specialist bees are. I wouldn't use immune, but they, they can process the toxins that are in there. Hmm. So the plant it's, has added extra chemicals that either repel other insects or outright kill them. Hmm. And they do these studies where they'll swap the pollen and nectar load in nests between two species of bees, everybody dies. Fascinating. Within the bee, within the species, yeah. everyone's fine. So Now, do you think it's are, something that they could process within their like regurgitant or is it I, happening here? I have no idea. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So I it would be the baby bee, that. but it would be the baby bee. Yeah. Because the that's true. mom bee does eat a little pollen. Yeah. We've been finding out more and more that they do have some pollen. Uh, they do eat it. And so you would suppose they're getting something out of it. Yeah. Remember, pollen is fat, lipid, protein. Protein, and the nectar is the sugar, right. carbohydrate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, perfect okay. food kind of situation. Yeah. But the adults are mostly, it would appear just based on looking at them, mm -hmm. mostly ingesting the nectars. So wow. you have uh, nectar plants that will have a lot of uh, bees on them. You know, it's hard to tell what they're doing. Are they just tanking up themselves? Mm -hmm. um, or like if you saw a male, that would be what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And then, because they don't help. Yeah. Um, and then with the female, it could be, you know, ingesting it to make pollen nectar load or um, get, gathering the pollen and ignoring the nectar, all kinds of things. Hmm. The overarching philosophy is that I want beds of one species of flower so that I can look at who's visiting it right. and we can set up and do various investigations about. So what we would like to have as an outcome is that each 
flower has a list of bees that visit it and sort of proportions, right? If you wait long enough, of course, every bee will visit that flower. And then uh, at the same time, we want for each bee, we want a list of, let's just call them favorite flowers. Mm -hmm. So that in the future, because of all the specialization, and also I should point out, no bee is like, oh, whatever, you know, any pollen and nectar is fine. They all have a sliding scale. Interesting. And so our, to get back to, what is our definition of, of specialization? Yeah. yeah, it's family level and below mm -hmm. on a plant family or mm -hmm. below. Um, but, you know, even honeybees, which people think of as the most general of generalists, they, have, they hate many plants. And so they really are only on a subset of all the different species of plants that are blooming at any one time. Hmm. And a lot of times... And they, when you think about them, you think about, oh, they're generalists, they could eat anywhere, but yeah. that's not necessarily so. Well, and then they have, you know, sort of desperation times yeah. too. Like, there's nothing like much out... like food, like anybody. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> okay, we really don't like this plant, yeah. but it's the only game in town right now, so I we're going really, in. I actually really think now if the honeybees, if they really like the crocuses that were in the lawn. <laughs> well, so think about it. So, a honey, first of all, honeybees absolutely so different from any of our native species. Yeah. Different model. It's what everyone knows, though. Mm -hmm. So, you ba basically, they are overwintering as a queen with a ball of, or of her daughters, and they're eating up all the honey, and it gets you know, they have less and less honey, and unless someone feeds them more sugar water or honey, sometimes they just die from starvation. Yeah. And then in the spring, though, there's still a whole bunch of workers. It gets warm. They're like, let's go and they look go and out. see what's out yeah, there. Yeah, they go out there. But they yeah. do crazy things um, at that time of year. So they'll do things like gather sawdust or anything that's hmm. like pollen-like, because why not? Yeah. And I don't, you know, obviously, maybe not, but I don't think that's any use to them. Yeah. But uh, they'll do wind pollinated plants and other things that might be blooming. Hmm. So they really will pressure, put pressure on the plant community at that time of year. I mean, I have seen them in our jelly feeders. Like they'll yeah. come to the jelly yeah, yeah. and like lick the sugar off the well, jelly. Well, <laughs> essentially a beekeeper would do yeah. something similar, not yeah, with that's jelly. True. They're yeah, gonna they feed them sugar. Sugar. And yeah. they'll process that. I don't know if they actually process it to honey mm -hmm. or they simply Just are eat eating it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. As an energy source. Okay, so then you, keep, you have the beds. Yeah. Do you kind of pack the beds thick with plants or do you leave open spaces and maybe also talk about the benefit yeah, yeah. of some open spaces? So it can be it can be anything. So mm -hmm. My basic strategy, you won't really, you can't really see it here because I just knocked down all the upper um, dry plants. But what you're seeing here is a bed that has periodically had um, arborist chips. So these are chips that a tree company would generate. Mm -hmm. So nothing fancy, and you'll see plenty of other beds with fresher ones on there. And then we plant through that. So a lot of youtube -y things are mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, you want to flip your lawn, mm -hmm. put down newspaper, then cardboard, mm -hmm. then some of those arborist chips. Mm -hmm. What we found is you don't need the newspaper and cardboard. Hmm. In fact, it interferes because mm -hmm. it dries the soil out. Interesting. Okay. And who knows what's in there, yeah. that stuff. And so we just bury the lawn in a lot of chip. Okay, so, like you, so my friend who used to do like 12 inches yeah, of yeah. chip to just really kill the lawn. Yeah, yeah. And he said it's about a minimum of 12 to kill the lawn. Well, we and tell people eight to 12. Okay. And it'll compress about half yeah. really quickly. And then you, but you can get chips that were chipped that day, dump them on the lawn, eight to 12, and then you can plant them that day. Mm. So but you're planting plugs and plants. Plants yeah. better just because they're bigger. And you want the bottom of the plug or plant, the bare part, to at least touch the soil. So you don't have to, because you got a lot of chip up there, mm -hmm. so they'll, you know, potentially they, the chips would um, also smother them mm -hmm. if you put it down too deep. You're making a, a um, you know, you're pulling it apart. We can show, I did some yeah, last fall. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah we can go down here and um, see um, some of that. And I also use other things like here from my wood shop, which is in the basement, I've so got- this is some hookara. Hookara, yeah. Americana. And interesting, this has a specialist bee and I'm waiting for it to show up. There is some hookara. And you found it here. You found the specialist bee on your hookara. No, I haven't. Okay, because I have, I, I also have plant, I bought 36 plants of hookara Americana. Yeah, hopes. yeah. <laughs> well, it could. So yeah. the question is, I have found Hookera Americana growing wild on the river yeah. down here, on the river banks. 
and but only a few. So I don't know if there's enough, mm-hmm. you know, to spread the things. population. And so if you look on iNaturalist or something, it's it's fairly dispersed in the yeah. area. There's not a lot of like I'm, you're not walking on um, hookara no. when you're in the woods. Yeah. So there could be, and a lot of times again, small bees. You'd be surprised that they just show up. So they could, Mm -hmm. and I'm planting more. I'm doing the same with several other groups, like um, the Lysomachias, the native Lysomachias. Which have the resin specialists. It's an oil specialist. Oil specialist, yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's any, there's absolutely no nectar Mm -hmm. in those um, Lysomachias, but they produce an oil, Mm -hmm. and so they're mixing the oil and pollen together. In their brood chambers or something for the babies? Yeah, yeah. And so they absolutely have to have Lysomachia, but there are several species. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Terrestris, which is the swamp candles. Right, Ciliata. Yep, yep. Then there's... um, there's, There's a, a couple. narrow leaf, I forget the yeah, name. Yeah, I can't remember. Lanceolata, I think. Maybe a couple others, yeah. too. Yeah, well, and I wonder, I always. some non-natives. I, yeah, I know there's some non-natives and also some cultivars, because they have the burgundy leaf right. one, and <clears> I <throat> always wonder whether well, they still produce the oils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I have that burgundy leaf one, because someone oh, gave it to yeah. me. And it just spreads like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I use it sometimes if I'm putting things into the wild as a marker, Yeah. because it's like, I can see you mm-hmm. from a long distance, and I have yet to see any of the macropus, which is the bee that goes That's to it. That's right. Um, on that, on the purple ones, but I've also not seen it on, I do have the straight native. It's hard to tell, that purple one is probably just a sport they found in mm. the wild, but it does bloom later. Oh, so it might not be in synchronized with right. the emergence of yeah. the macropus, okay. Hard to say yeah. what's going on sometimes. And there's, I mean, they're so uncommon that there hasn't been enough studies to really like bracket what's going on. Okay. But anyway, last year we did get macropus on our ones at the research lab. Oh. But on the narrow leafed or the lanceolata. Now, would you ever, this may be a kind of against like what you would do, mm. but you know how you'd, you would, um, you know, maybe take a wild animal and you put it into a, like a, like a wildlife refuge or you kind of mm-hmm. just put it into another place, yeah. you know? Would you ever do that with a bee? Would you ever um, say, okay, bee, I well, want you to over here? I would, <laughs> I would do that, but I don't know if that's useful, Yeah. right? Okay. I don't see any like uh, philosophical problem with doing right. it, but you know, just like bringing the bee out. I would be like spread, spreading the population is right, right. what I would think, but, yeah. You know, Let's say, oh, there's the bee. Yeah. Let's, I'm going to catch it and I'm going to move it. Yeah. Well, what would, would that bee do? It, exactly. It, it's like, or, ah, this is not my place. So I'm going yeah, to go find it. Yeah, he's like, where's it. my family? <laughs> it's like box turtles do yeah. that. Ah. So if you pick up a box turtle in mm-hmm. the woods and you bring it home, and then you go like, oh, I'm done with this box turtle now. I'm going to let it go uh-huh. in my woods across my street. It starts walking. Oh. And it gets eventually <laughs> crushed by a car oh, or something. Oh, don't say that. Some horrible he's a thing. Bad, I think Sam would be a bad storyteller. He's like, sometimes... I like, I like, like the bad stories because like, it's the bee, fun. The mama bee is burying you in a dirt coffin and you, <laughs> you might tell, not be able to come up. I like up. to tell kids when I'm get, talking to elementary schools. Yeah. And then the other one is the, you know, you're in... I say, think think about this. You know, there's these bees that mm-hmm. are parasites of other bees. But it's like this. Your mom puts you in a room fills it with candy, okay? It's dark, and then she leaves. She ne- you never see your mom again, but you have all this candy, you're eating it, and then you hear a sound in that room, and it turns out it's another um, bee, or a human, whatever you want to call yourself, and it is going to come and kill you, and then eat all your candy. <laughs> So He's usually the teacher kids. is like, stop, right? <laughs> let's, let's back off. But I think that makes it life interesting. It does. It actually, it actually it's not does. not all roses out yeah. there. No, know? it's true. I'm actually getting distracted because I see oh, yeah. that there's like... This is the bee wall. This is like amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not amazing yet. So when this, this, these have just come out... And when this place is cooking, there's hundreds of nests in this wall. Now, what kind of bees are in here? Yeah, this is interesting also. Um, this is Anthophora villasula and other things. You can see some other bees going in and out that are like, smaller. Like, would an osmia be in yeah, here? Yeah, there's some osmia okay. that nest in the holes that are basically old holes of the Anthophora. And um, there's several, there, might, there was another oh, species nice of Anthophora. I think it was a turkey vulture. Yeah. Um, but you can see the smaller osmia using the Oh, he just landed, actually. Sorry. He's in the tree. He just landed ah. in the tree. Usually I just see them in the air, you know what yeah. I mean? Oh, yeah. Dude. We don't yeah. have any dead things today for you. Uh, I don't know. The way you're telling those stories, it sounds well, like, I mean, he, he's like, hold your stories of death. <laughs> Let we me have over. leftover deer parts, and then it's like a total <laughs> oh, vulture party. Oh, you should just leave it party. out for them. Yeah, Well, amazing. we do. 
Um, okay, so t tell me about okay. this because this is awesome. So it's like it's a clay and straw bale I see. In yeah. Some so you can actually foam. see the straw bale, and I actually <laughs> dug that area out to send someone some of the nests. Okay. Um, but also, what's happened is that a woodpecker, very similar to carpenter bee mm -hmm. nests, a woodpecker figured out that just below the surface is yummy baby bees, and so oh, all no. of, mostly what you're seeing here is damage from the woodpeckers that are coming in and extracting out. And periodically we, you know, put on a new layer of plaster and then, you know, I mean, yeah, cuz this over. is the side of a uh your house. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a most whole people straw would freak bale. out about this, you know. Um, but, probably, but yeah. most people are not going to build a house like this. Yeah. So. And you're like most yeah. people are not me. Exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. I'm not a model for anybody. I, I, I was. I was like, we were talking about because we put a birdhouse in the gable, and uh -huh. people are like, "You're gonna get bird do." I'm like, I I'll pass up bird do any day to see birds in the right. gable. <laughs> we get bees. I'll, yeah. But none of these sting. I mean, yeah. it's possible if you grab the female that it would sting you. But it's not, they're not defending these nests. They're basically solitary moms. And there's just a lot of them. And I for love most it. people, I, it's freaky. Honestly, even if it wasn't on the side of your house and somebody just wanted to do like a kind of clay mound like that. Oh, you can. You, you know, yeah. just having that as like a little bee hay stack, like it would be amazing. Oh, well, you know? um, I have, so there's another species that's native. This mm -hmm. is not native. Mm -hmm. um, None of these are native here? No. Okay. Well, the, some of the osmia using the hole could be native. Mm -hmm. There's also non-native osmia. But the, um, we have a native how bee. Would, how were they brought in? How are they, how are the non-native? So, bees? several different ways. So, sometimes it's just inadvertent. Like yeah. a lot of these are hole nesters, so they come in on shipping crates or okay, dunnage yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And then others were brought in in the 80s when that was a thing to do by USDA as like, oh, this is a better pollinator for some <sighs> reason. So the Anthophora villasula, which has never developed into a pollinator system, mm -hmm. you know, that commercially is viable, uh, was brought in by USDA and here they are. Um, and it's only in the um, Washington DC area. They've gone to Baltimore and um, they're slowly bumping out. So many, many other people will have the species um, in their clay banks or something like that. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like cliff, like little mm -hmm. cliffs or whatever, and they're just kind of going into the cliffs and yeah. the little, you know, Well, um, in other more normal houses, they're under the deck in the dry soil. I see. And, um, and so people, you know, get disturbed by that too. Hmm. But again, don't do anything. Yeah. And we have a, we have non -na we have native counterparts that are anthophoras, and they make little tubes of mud and they were, actually we might see if we go around the corner. Sure, let's do it. They were nesting there. They seem to move every few years, um, but I think maybe some of the nests are still there. And this is a, an absolute sign. Yeah, see this? Oh yeah, see, oh yeah. See the little tubes coming out? Yeah. Um, so they like deeper mud. So this is eight inches of uh, soil here, where that's just a, a skim coat over the straw bales. I see. For, you know, fun reasons. And um, um, so, you will see these in a variety of different places, but you can, like at, at work, we make um, little, um, they could be anything, but um, we put them in pots and we put, um, so clay soil, just from mm -hmm. the ground, just subsoil really, clay pots or, or like even styrofoam this. boxes, like little, anything yeah, like that. Yeah, like a, and we have a shed uh -huh. and we put them in and we put them, you know, we fill it with clay, put it on the side, put it up. Do they have to they be any in. sort of height? Oh, They're uh, at several the different heights. You know, basically you want to do it so you can look at it. Yeah, okay. Um, so in the wild, they're in upturned root masses. So you have ah, a huge tree, falls, falls over, over in clay the woods, vertical, yeah. or cliffs uh, that have clay on the outside. Yeah, that's how I kind of would commonly see them as, on cliffs. This is fascinating. What do you think about this? This is cool, like yeah, having a little, cool. like a structure for bees. I mean, I can, like there's so many of them. Out now, like when it's uh -huh. early spring. I know, and you only have like a daffodil and like a couple. Right. <laughs> well, the, there's a bunch of stuff in the woods, in the woods and there's, yeah. you know, if we look in, closely, in there's the, a bunch of. In um, the there's a bunch flowers, of flowers, like in the. Yeah, I'm not sure this stuff. So this is one of the brassicas. It's out very early. I don't see anything and on the, it, well, but the, I haven't studied and this, it. this, they love these. Yeah, Vernonia. Yeah. Um, but um, and this that's is like more, a little mint. This is more what they're after yeah. is the uh, purple dead nettle, which yeah. is that one, or henbit, I'm not sure which, ground ivy. Yes. Which is my nemesis, or one because of my nemesis. Because it goes nemesis. into every bed, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but they I mean, love the mulch it. kills it. They love it. it. 
Yeah, so queen bumblebees are on uh, particularly ground ivy mm -hmm. in the early spring. So it turns out that you can provide something for them. Oh yeah, um, that is a chrysidid wasp. So that's a nest that's a, parasite. Oh. Um, or it's a wasp that parasitizes uh, the uh, bees nests. So it might be there for the Osmia nest or it yeah. might be going for the Anthophora. This is a place to go, just yeah. straight ahead. <laughs> Seems to be chilling there. Yeah. Um, but who knows? But also see all these stems right yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah, these they are like also bee nests. Mm -hmm. So Osmia are, I just throw things out. So Osmia are nesting in there somewhere and then you can see these old holes. So some bees like to nest in pith. So a bee has carved out the pith, like serotinus, and then it's plugged up the end. Yeah, and we have some that would uh, like, you know, cut a leaf, like leaf cutters, and yeah. then they would put yeah, yeah. like leaves in it yeah, as well. Yeah, mega Kylie. Yeah, mega um, Kylie. So now here's a question. Here's a question mm -hmm. because people buy bee houses. We right. have bee houses. They make bee houses. Mm -hmm. They have bamboo sticks. They mm -hmm. collect sticks. Do you have to clean them out? Like once they are kind of plugged up, what do you do? What's the kind of like maintenance of okay. those. Okay, so this is a question that comes up a lot. So uh, if you, you never find a good answer for it. So. Well, <laughs> I have an answer okay. whether you have to decide whether it's good or not. Okay. So basically there's uh, commercial operators who sell mason bee nests mm -hmm. to orchards, mm -hmm. okay, for pollination. So they have to be on it, right? If they, so they're trying to grow huge numbers and so you have all these nests and all these bees all in one place so the parasites find them. And so you can decrease the number of parasites by doing some things like pulling out the tubes, which they use, so they use paper tubes. You don't see no, any paper tubes mm -hmm. there. And then they'll split them open and they'll you know, pull out the cocoons and they do some sorting out of things that have been parasitized and things that are not. Hmm. And that's good if you're going to go into commercial operation. You have to do it or you'll be tanking. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're just a homeowner, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Right, and you're not going to um, change the ship of osmia nesting by putting in a few tubes here and there. But it is fun to watch, and it's very cool to see. And you do have bees, more bees pollinating probably a lot of your orchard crops. Mm -hmm. So what you want here's what I would say. First of all, you don't need to buy a house. Mm -hmm. You can make their, your own out of sure. Phragmites or you, bamboo or you can make them by Elderberry, just drilling. Elderberry. You know, well, just yeah. drilling holes yeah. in wood. Any yeah. scrap piece of wood will Well, get and I, I get a lot of scrap pieces of bamboo that come with plants and stuff right. like that. So you could always well, just... Well, so you have to be careful because a lot of the bamboo might be too big. Right. right? It comes so in the all different sizes. Yeah. You what's have to have the tips. Okay. And what what's the ideal diameter? Because these are quite um, small. Well, when you're buying... Um, uh, drill bits to make these kinds of things. I tell people one eight, three eighths, and five eighths. Okay. And just drill them, you know, as deep as you can go with that drill bit. Um, you don't need to buy anything special. And so there's a lot of information. Again, commercially, you want a really long drill bit, mm -hmm. right? But if you're just doing it for fun, then any old drill bit will do. And then you put it out, like now is the time. Mm -hmm. They're making nests. And you put it on your porch where you sit or at the kitchen window or where between the car and the house. So you can watch what's going on. And then um, they, that will continue throughout the whole year. So the spring you have Osmia, then you have a variety of other species uh, that use it. It can be a huge range. It can be some little solitary wasps and then nest parasites and all kinds of stuff. And then at the end of the year, um, just move that whole nest, leave it out or if you want, but move it to like the back of your property, put it there and put a new one in. Okay. So you can watch it. Okay. But you, like if it's, it's if it's plugged up, mm -hmm. do you ever have to, do you have to clear that out? No. No. It, and will they, will they reuse that, I guess is what I'm Some. saying. Some yeah. will, okay. But that's why I say, you know, because it's so easy to get these nests or make them, yeah. just put in a fresh set of nests yeah. so that you can watch the action and move the old nests into the back of your property right, okay. in vari various places. And then those bees will leave yeah. and they may, other bees may use that same nest structure, but you don't have to worry about these kinds of things, right. which obviously you're spending a lot of time yeah. thinking about. Yeah. And, you know, I've definitely so seen nest parasites on 
like our oh, little, they're always on the on bee there. house. So because yeah. I saw them like, and I also saw one carrying a leaf in its mouth, and I was like, it's just so amazing. I know. <laughs> and the nest parasites are just as interesting. It's just as interesting. I didn't want to. Didn't want to you know, do anything. I didn't want to interfere. They're species too. Yes, exactly. So, exactly. Um, some of them. There's a couple that are problematic because they're not native, but a lot of that is around anyway. But a bunch of them, like that little chrysidid wasp mm -hmm. is, that we just saw. That's a native species. Yeah, so beautiful too. You're supporting that too. Yeah. Well, wasps are okay pollinators. I wouldn't call them great. So the bees are great pollinators. Everyone else is sort of like even the butterflies flowers are kind taking of like, the advantage. Yeah. You have a butterfly, long yeah. legs, big yeah, long nectar, tube. The, like they're not just hitting taking the nectar. <laughs> skippers though can have do a face plant because they're shorter mm -hmm. and they they do some pollination. It depends, you know. Like milkweed is often the pollinia which are not usable by bees, right? So it's a mechanical hmm. clip to particularly great spangled fritillary, great spangled fritillaries, yeah. um, and clip physically, and they move them. Any big insect is a mover of pollinia. Hmm. So there's many, many circumstances where a plant might be wasp-oriented or butterfly-oriented, but in general, you know, the heavy lifting, if you just did the Excel spreadsheet, is mostly bees because they are using the pollen. So the plant has many more opportunities to kind of co-opt that system. And the bees are very efficient. You know, they're gathering lots of pollen. It's not an accident. Mm. Now I'm curious, like, and this may not be part of the role of what you're doing at the USGS, but I would love to go to an independent garden center or a plant center and mm -hmm. find all of my specialist pollinator plants mm -hmm. in the area. And yeah. that, you cannot do that yet. Like at least where I am, right? And and we have a lot of native, the, plant but they people. could do that. They could do that. Yeah. Yes, they could do that. that. Information's there. Yeah, and I and I have had to have had to go to all various different places uh -huh. to get my sources of plants. Luckily, you could find some more in plug form, right. so you could buy a lot for a little less money. But is that part of the goal of the USGS? Are, are you just like more educating people so that the information is out right. there, so that they could? Take yeah. that extra mile? We're, like, what do you see? We're basically see? a support group. So, for example, we help support Jared Fowler, who did the websites on specialist bees of the US. And, you know, we have lots of information and um, we'll develop techniques for doing surveys. Um, we'll do um, that very basic, like, what bees are coming to, which plant, with different um, techniques. It's, you know, tedious. You're not going to probably get um, tenure by sitting around watching bees or having your camera watch bees come to camp to, and just making that list over and over again. But that's that's like our jam. And so same and, thing with surveys. And maybe like we should have maybe addressed this right from the beginning, but tell folks why these specialist pollinators are important because Oftentimes when I talk mm -hmm. about pollinators, when people think about pollinators, they're like, oh, are you raising honeybees? Right, right. And they d immediately go to that. But yeah. tell me about like the importance of these specific pollinators right. and their relation to honeybees as well. Okay. So honeybees, first of all, is they're n none of them are native. And everything you know about honeybees does not exist in the native bee as a strategy. So that's a good thing because the diseases and pathogens of honeybees rarely um, are transmitted to the native species. That's good to know because that was a big concern during colony collapse disorder. Right, well, and so the other part of that is um, this sort of um, uh, laissez-faire thing about pollination. Like everything got pollinated in the past pretty easily, so no one really paid that much attention as who's doing the pollination. So during colony collapse of honeybees, because pathogens from Asia is basically the story, came in from other species of honeybees, everyone was like, oh my God, all of our pollination issues in crops, we're gonna tank and everyone will starve to death. Um, but it turns out that when people started looking, a lot of the native bees in, at least in the east, had the capacity to move in and do that pollination. Now in industrial agricultural areas, you're still very dependent. Think of the almond crop. Yeah, bringing the honeybees in. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember if it's 50% or 75% of all commercial honeybees from the East Coast everywhere end up in California. Yeah, I th and I think they go to the sunflower crop. They go to apples then, mm -hmm. I think, in Washington. They make this, like, loop. 
There they is. go oranges yeah. in Florida, and then oftentimes they go to the almond crop in California, then to the Pacific Northwest for apples, and then they go to sunflower crop in the Dakotas. So there's different Alaska's. strategies yeah. in terms of like which ones you go to and right. what contracts you have yeah. if you're a commercial beekeeper. And some people are doing commercial operations and just want to stay local. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's geared towards, say, New England and, um, you know, blueberry, uh, cranberry, apple, and not. But it turns out that in most of those um, situations, you don't need to have honeybees. You have a lot of options in terms of natives. And now more and more we're looking at, well, how do we build up these native um, species so that um, if the honeybee does completely tank, for whatever reason, the you know pollination needs of our various crops are going to be met. Um, and, and I know in Cornell they did some research around apple orchards or yeah. orchards in particular, where they like if you leave meadow plants, golden rocks, right, right. all, all around, then you get the native pollinators, and they actually pollinate better. Than yeah, they're more the, efficient more on efficient, a per yeah. visit thing. Um, so yeah, honeybees are often very extractive. So think about a honeybee. There's that ball of pollen and nectar. Ball of pollen and nectar doesn't pollinate anything mm -hmm. because it's just a big blob of, of like a rock. So a lot of the native species don't do that. Bumblebees are an exception. Yeah, because they get messy. <laughs> they, so they're just covered in pollen. Yeah. And they move, they might move the pollen to a carrying place, but it's still loose mm -hmm. pollen. So that's probably at least part of it. And sometimes, you know, they're just better fits. So blueberries, for example, there's many, many examples. So Comfrey. blueberries, cranberries yeah. Yeah. are um, have to be buzz pollinated to do it efficiently. Mm -hmm. So you can pound in the number of honeybee hives and they will pollinate those crops. But the native species um, vibrate the flowers at a certain frequency and the pollen, which is in, uh, it's called poriferous, so it's in uh, the stamens are kind of globbed together and there's holes at the bottom. It's basically like a salt shaker. You have to shake the pollen out. So honeybees don't do that. They don't know the song, but the native species do. So there's all these kinds of stories because cranberry and blueberries are mm -hmm. native plants. Yeah. And so that's the bigger picture here with specialists. So both those crops have specialist bees that go to them. You have 150 million years of coevolution between plants and bees. And over time, certain plants have decided that their strategy is to neck down the number of pollinators that are they would like to visit and give their specialist bees better access, you know, um, and poison the others and better food for them, whatever it is. Yeah. And so that's, you know, one aspect of why specialist bees are important. There's a bald eagle. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we have a nest right behind the um, house here. That's incredible. We could go down and see it at some <laughs> point. It's like so That's sidetracked by bird. nature. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's so yeah, yeah. good. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, there's yeah. a really cool swamp. I heard it coming there. from the side and then I was like, where, you know, you heard it. Yeah, I yeah. heard it's high pitched trill. Yeah. Yep. God I bless right America. There. There's two of them. <laughs> yeah, there's another one over yeah. there. It's great. It's it's interesting because I, like the the woods look a little bedraggled right now. I don't know if they start to green up or whatever, but it. I, well, these are very beat up woods. I was gonna say yeah. So um, the history of this area outside of this property, because this property had a house on it, uh, that was all mined. So this is oh, roadbed for, for stone Route or? 301. Okay. Yeah, it's gravel and sand. Oh, wow. So they dug it out and they walked away. Wow. And so what you're looking at is what, you know, back then they didn't re try to repair No rehabilitation, anything. yeah. Yeah. But um, so it's been interesting to um, look and watch the recovery. You know, um, you have a bunch of um, plants that are... Um, adapted to living in forests, um, but a lot of the ones that come up, the vernal plants, the ones that mm -hmm. bloom in early spring mm -hmm. on the forest floor, they don't move quickly. Mm. They're not used to um, having to go somewhere to find a new forest. Um, their seeds are heavy, often moved around by ants and all kinds of things. So they're gradually moving in from the bottomlands where there was a tiny fringe right. that um, was either left or recovered enough because they graveled right into the, wow. the riverbed. Wow. And so it's fun to watch what's going on. Yeah.
also forget carpenter bees, I, I wonder. Oh, yeah. And how do you I've feel got, about that? I've got tons <laughs> of carpenter bees, um, particularly in that house over there. Yeah. But here too, but not as much. Do you um, worry about them at all or no? no. Not so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like them. Okay, so we, he, he we doesn't worry whole, about carpenter bees. We have there. a whole pro carpenter bee um, screed that we yeah. can hand out and I can give it to you. Oh yeah, I would love. Sure and we're gonna uh, start a club. Yeah. I'm not sure if my deck structure would. Uh, <laughs> um, so here's the here's the thing. Okay. We'll talk he's carpenter gonna, bees. He's gonna because break this it down, is, carpenter bees. You know, we were at one, the. Um, there's what so our house has these giant beams. Basically, mm -hmm. they're cedar. It's cedar. And that's oh, the roof. candy. <laughs> candy. So there's been one bee. One carpenter bee who had made a hole in there that I noticed. That's it? That's just that's one. nothing. But that's where it starts. <laughs> yeah. So tell us more about okay. carpenter bees. Okay, so carpenter bees are native mm -hmm. and they naturally nest in soft woods and people have created like the perfect environment for carpenter bees. So thank you people. And any <laughs> people. soft wood is going to be inhabited by carpenter bee nests eventually. So anything from a bench so redwood bench, cedar bench, people don't realize it, but underneath that bench is a carpenter bee female that comes in, because the holes are almost always under. Uh, I see, things. so it's, it's softwood, so if you had like a house built of oak, for instance, then nope. no, no it interest. wouldn't want, interesting. Well, this, this house here, all yeah. those rafter tails are oak. There is not one carpenter bee in there. Huh. That house is built with um, pine, Yeah. and the rafter tails are loaded. Wow. And that was built, um, you know, pushing almost 100 years ago, yeah. that was built roughly 15 years ago. So what kind of oak? Red oak? Or? Any oak. Oak is all um, hardwood. They just want softwood. So soft would be yeah. hemlock, right. soft would be Because I've also pine. put up like, I put up like the wood that they give you when you order lumber, the, just to keep it off the ground. Uh -huh. I drill holes in that and put it up on the deck to see if I can deter them from going into the deck. They want the deck. But they want the older, <laughs> softer wood, I think. And it's probably, down, well, it's so. a combination of things, right? It's um, location. So maybe where you put it is like not their jam, right? <laughs> so, um, and they like to come in from underneath. They do like super soft things. And additionally, you may put up great nesting habitat and they may like it, like in arbors are often mm -hmm. the place. So that's great, but it doesn't mean that you've, they move from that structure to that. It means now you've doubled right. the number in the area. <laughs> so, I love how bees. I love how territorial they are. In particular, yeah. they they they, get they, so mad at they go at each other. It's well, so, those are the males. Yeah. So the males they're always are patrolling. Terri terri you know, <laughs> they're they're controlling a territory of um, wood mm -hmm. with nesting females in it, and so they're fighting other males, and they're basically like motion detectors, but not very good ones. <laughs> So they, if you come onto the deck, they have to check you out. They, they do, they, they get right do, up in your face. Right. <laughs> if you take a pebble yeah. and you can throw that pebble, they will chase the pebble. <laughs> and they will also chase airplanes across the sky. <gasps> so, but eventually they figure it out, yeah. right? And they don't sting, no male bee stings. Yeah, sometimes so. they hit the window so hard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, you, they might be invisible looking at themselves. air or something. <laughs> but um, uh, so, there's no problem there. So let's talk about the females. So mm -hmm. the females are doing all the work and they make the nest hole, they can only go about six inches a year. So year number one is the most difficult year because they have to initiate that hole. They're very exposed, you know, other predators. They do, do they like pre-holes, like pre-drilled holes or not so much? That would be great. Okay. Yeah, because each subsequent year, now that there is a hole, it that hole will be reoccupied by so, another female. So are they going into like the end grain essentially if they go, have to go six inches in? They usually don't go in the end grain. Okay. They're yes. going they go underneath. The side, but then they go with the grain. Oh, yeah. I see, yeah. yeah. And they never make mistakes. So hmm. it's not like uh, they, they their holes are about half inch. If they have a three quarter inch board, they're gonna stay right in that board, not go like, whoops, I, my hole went out to the side. Oh. And so you don't really have any idea what's going on inside mm -hmm. these things. Um, but it takes a long time for them to, you know, really riddle a board with um, round holes. And structurally, those little round holes are, um, if you were to damage a piece of wood, that's what you would do to retain as much structural integrity. So m most of the time, it's decades before you are in a structural bind, mm -hmm. like it's gonna collapse or something. So you don't, you know, 
houses don't fall down from carbon abuse. Mm -hmm. um, the more the issue is that at some point, the woodpeckers, is usually just one, yeah. figures it out yep. and starts ripping out the holes along the wood edge and it expo to expose the young or whatever else is in there. And it looks terrible, right? And then people are upset. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not upset. And I've got like a million. Yeah, can you show us? I, I can. And yeah. then also like all the, well, we can, you want to go see them? Yeah, let's go, yeah, yeah. Let's go walk. Okay. We can walk. And also almost every one of those four by fours, you would think they would avoid treated, but they don't. They don't avoid treated either. Nope. Okay. Not those. And they're. <laughs> they, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. Treated wood index. Yeah. In fact, most of them are. Yeah. And the, um, yeah, they, like yeah, from here, I can see the, carpenter bee holes in those four by fours. Huh. And then the pileated woodpeckers in particular come and just like tear the, those apart. This is a beautiful color wall. Oh yeah, is this, this, is, like... this is a lime, uh, sand, um, and chopped straw plaster. Huh. It's eroded a little bit, but not much. And um, I, this, is, this house is where I live, but I helped with some of the building, but a uh, buddy of ours, Eric Hempstead, did most of the buildings really Appropriate last high name. end. Yes. Hempstead, you know. Right, we did not have any hemp to put in. <laughs> I know. He would have. But it, you can make a hemp house, it's a Hempstead. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's a great name. Sometimes um, you just become your so name. So if we take a look at uh, up there is here, a, here, like for example, that yeah. rafter tail, you can see there was a hole, but the woodpeckers have yeah. drilled that out. I have another um, yeah, porch there, over it? here that is um, uh, where it's lower. So here you can see so the woodpeckers have been in and have been tearing well, out those. It's not about fears, it's about <laughs> escalation over time. <laughs> well, in the, in the end, you're gonna do, if you really want to bring the numbers down, you can't kill your way out of this because there's an infinite number of, um, of uh, carpenter bees. You can see even here, the decking is, they really like the decking. I don't know what, but look at all the holes there. Yeah. And look at how wow. the woodpeckers have hung upside down and have started ripping out those decking board sections where they can hear a baby carpenter bee in there. But you can see that there's oh. quite a bit. And I have to say too, the way I discovered yeah. that there was a bee in one of the beams is because when I was working behind my desk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard a chewing sound. Oh, that's right. Oh. Yeah. And it was driving me nuts. Cool. And I was like, wondering where it was coming yeah, from. Because it's ah. so quiet. And then I mm -hmm. listened to the beam and then, and then I heard hear that there the was You heard it in, in you were inside or I outside? I was inside. And these beams are huge. Uh-huh. So they then go I the went whole to go width outside. Of the house. I went to go outside and then I saw that there was a little hole in the bottom of it and none uh -huh. of the other beams have it, but that one did. And right. It was I mean, so, you have you ever, to be careful. Can you refill the hole? Like, yeah, would yeah. they be able to get out? Well, that's the control thing. Yeah. But I also will mention that particularly in wooden houses, there are a couple different species of what they call old house borers. And so these are beetles that um, will um, literally chew into your wood, and it's so extreme an environment, very dry mm -hmm. and not very nutritive, that it takes them often years to complete their cycle. To emerge, yeah. Yeah, as and a, what an you'll adult. see inside is a, at, when they are getting ready to emerge, you'll see little sawdust coming down, hmm. and you can actually see them kind of pushing it out. And did then you they'll ever emerge. find the bee? Or, yeah. did, or you found the bee? Yeah. So it yeah. was a bee? It could be, okay. but I'm just saying that could this be. is <laughs> another problem. I've got them in the other house, not this one yeah. yet. And um, they will, um, uh, um, you know, but the thing about them is they're so slow. Like they're called, um, I think one of them is called the death's head borer. I've seen that one because of the the patterning on the back, right? It's not, I don't oh. think that. I, you're thinking of death's head moth. Moth, moth. maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That one does have a death's head yeah. on it. But the uh, death's head, or I can't remember exactly, yeah, exactly. But something like that. You know, it goes like, you're there very late at night and it's oh, silent. It's, <laughs> and it's like Satan In knocking. the middle of night. And it, <laughs> and it just, you'll hear this. The Grim Reaper. <laughs> And then there's a long pause, and then you'll hear. And um, anyway, 
just another thing that you can Halloween have inside your house. Halloween is Sam's favorite time of year. That's right. <laughs> I love these little things that you have, like just around your house, where you're like, oh, oh yeah, I there's have a bee. I have there's this little... the Osmia nest. And you, see, these were from last year, yeah. and every single one was full, but now these have emerged. So you uh, can see where there was mud. Yeah. Um, and they chewed through. So take me through the life cycle. So that you have, when when does the mother start putting the mud? Like, is it in fall? And do they emerge in spring? Um, so these are almost all spring bees. Okay. So these were almost 100% sure were all osmia. And so she gathers pollen and nectar, she goes into a hole, and then she deposits the pollen and nectar, and then eventually lays an egg and then walls it off. And, and there's one baby per cells. hole? Nope. Or no, series of cells. Series okay. of cells, depending on how deep that hole is. But what, what if the one in the back emerges before yeah. the one at the oh, front? That might be one right there. Yeah. But the, um, yes, so people have studied that. Yeah. And um, so every once in a while, the one in the back, which you would think would hatch first because it was mm -hmm. the oldest, mm -hmm. um, but again, you have this very lengthy time period where they're sitting in there. So a day or two doesn't really matter that much. Um, and I can't remember, it was like the ones in the back are males and the ones in the front are females or vice versa. So they sometimes can like kill their sisters and brothers yeah. by climbing out oh. and you know basically messing them up. But I don't know, people have looked at that yeah. and they would be better to look at what they've done. Gosh, it's almost better than you would think to make a shallow hole so that she goes, many shallow holes so that she only ha could put one or two in. <laughs> they like, they prefer longer the holes. The longer holes, like okay. If we've so done that's why you said with the drill studies. bit, like go as long as possible. Yeah, or, you know, if you're working with straws, they mm -hmm. choose the long straws. Like okay. You, we use Phragmites a bunch. Yeah. And, um, you know, the inevitably. The invasive haplotype or the, yeah. the native haplotype? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sure it's the invasive one. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> the one that stays around for too long. We're not adding to yeah. the population by using them for Well, that's nests. good. I mean, just, you could just say, I have this little extra end grain, you know, this piece of wood, I'm gonna drill some holes in it and put, oh, yeah. put it by the that's house. That's just a cut off a of a four by four yeah. and actually treated. Yeah. And they're doing fine. Amazing. Um, it gives people so inspiration. many options. Yeah, many options. I tell, tell people like, give your child the portable drill and just yeah. tell them to drill any piece of wood. Like the neighbor's, <laughs> neighbor's fence, your front porch. Yeah. They, those all work and the kid will have fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'd imagine so. Your neighbor would probably be Firewood, <laughs> rafter tails. Yeah. No one notices. That's the yeah. thing. Like Can if you, you drill full of holes, no one's going to see. Now when they do like the bee homes and everything, obviously we are think we're talking a lot about wood, but can you talk about like leaving bear patches up? Because there's uh -huh. most of our native bees are nesting in the ground, right. correct? Yeah. So this is whole thing where where people will say, oh, I don't put down mulch because the bees are can't move through the mulch. Mm -hmm. First of all, there are some bees that can, but mm -hmm. not very many, it's true. But the bees can fly, so the bees will move from foraging on all the plants that are in the mulch beds and find a place nearby to, you know, go into the open ground. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I tell people, like, if you want a place to look at stuff, then just put in a big pile of dirt somewhere mm -hmm. that a big pile of dirt is appropriate or sand and stuff will nest in that. Like, don't worry too much about like, I need to provide that. Okay, they'll, they'll fly it. somewhere and find yeah. it. Okay. In most cases, it's not a problem. So what are you doing here? Is this kind of just like, you, it seems this like you knocked down a lot of, do you keep this like meadow-esque? I can't really tell. Yeah, so um, what I've done is there are a lot of really big perennials in here that have very, it's a mix, that have very tall um, plants. So there's some Jerusalem artichoke, which I have to continuously fight to, from taking over the place. Um, cut leaf coneflower, um, a bunch of the, you know, silphiums and a, a variety of things. And you can see some clumps and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I go, I actually really have become enamored with battery operated, um, uh, weed whips, so weed whips or what string are, trimmers. Oh, string trimmers. String okay. trimmers, rather. And because and, and not and not like a like one of those. Uh, no, this is a brush, but they have. Um, so I have a Dewalt, and I think others do this too. Yeah. And Weave I can Makita. just take off the um, the the uh, string trim attachment and yeah. just jam in the brush blade one. And I can, that's what I do is I just take that brush blade and in oh. 10 minutes, yeah. I knock this whole place down. Yeah. And then 
it's a call. Sometimes I'll pick everything up and move it somewhere else because you know, I may want access to the ground yep. for more weed control. And you do that in, in the spring, right? So that you're not, because some of those nesting bees might be in those stalks. Are you Most likely they're not. Really? Okay, yeah. so, tell me about that. Um, so most of the bees that nest in stems yeah. can't penetrate the wall of the stem. So they are looking for either some kind of damage to the stem, uh -huh. you know, a borer or whatever during the growing season, but more often they're after um, things that have snapped off or are browsed down. Okay. Um, so deer sometimes have a, a, value, a value for creating for cuts, but a, a, if you brush hog, for example, a field and leave it pretty high, yeah. that's like optimal for a lot of bee species. Oh, fascinating. Particularly like blackberry stems and um, all yeah. the brambles are okay. great places. But, you know, each bee has its own proclivity and so what I generally am shooting for is something like an eight to 12 inch height. You can see um, it's not at all pristine, like I really did this in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm leaving those stems up and then bees can nest in it, but they the stems have to be around for the next year, yeah. right? So either they'll stay upright or more often they just fall over and then they'll emerge and the cycle continues. It's a little murky as to how to manage for that, mm -hmm. but if you cut it to the ground and then compost everything, that's, you know, not gonna do anything. Yeah, cause right now, I mean, we're managing our meadow in the sense that like we cut it down once a year and uh -huh. we're, we're trying to cut it like about now is when we would yeah, yeah. cut it. No, that's okay. perfect. I tell people like the optimal management strategy for um, a place that you wanna keep open is mow it once a year in the winter. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, depending on your property, like you can't get in in the spring because it's too wet. It's too wet, wet yeah. Um, so, and then also you have things like contracts for um, highways and municipalities and places like that, which are really where a lot of good can happen very quickly. If you, for example, just leave one mower deck next to the woods, unmown throughout the year around that playing field that was carved out of the woods, ruining everything, then you have given it back and then just mow it in the winter. Um, so working with the facilities people is in some ways where most of the, the action and the good happens, right? Mm. You talk to an administrator and maybe they'll agree with you, but they still have to talk to the, the guy on the mower right. and convince them. So giving talks to those people is really better. Yeah. I have a question. Are there any like non-native plants that have come in that have become like, that are actually quite vital for specialist pollinators? Mm -hmm. And like things like I'm thinking of, like for instance, and I know you specialize in bees, but right. this is a kind of an analog where you have uh, like our black swallowtail could go on fennel right. and loves fennel. Yeah. And, or like our Daucus corota, wild, wild carrot, there's yeah. a lot of insects that will use. Which may or may not be native. Which may or may not be native, that's true yeah. too. Um, I think there's some parasit parasitic, uh, parasitoid wasps that actually use, and I don't know if those are native or not, that use the, the wild carrot. But right. are there any non-native plants like that that have supplemented the diet of some of our native? Yeah, plants? weirdly. Um, but a lot of times in this the case I'll show you, and there's probably others that I'm not thinking of, the uh, species, the non-native species has a close congener in the U.S. So a mock orange. Yeah. And it's the one that's planted sort of, it's an old-fashioned plant. And I had some here. Mm. I mostly killed it, though. But the, um, the phylanthus um, attracts a bee called Chalostoma philadelphii, and... Which is like the Philadelphus kind yeah, that it we is. have it's, the mock it's so, uh, it's so connected to that plant yeah. that they even named it after that plant. And the, but the weird thing is, is like the, the native Philadelphus is super rare. And we can't quite figure out the system because sometimes we can find the bee and we are pretty sure that there's no Philadelphus tame or not anywhere mm. nearby. So mm. there's a lot of mysteries, but you know, Guaranteed, if you go into any little town or village or even a big city and you see mock orange, you will find that plant. Hmm. I did a study. You'll find that bee. Find the bee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I did a, so there's a, 
USDA germplasm center here, great, because they have all these plants and they're all labeled. Mm -hmm. And so they had a whole collection of Philadelphus from mostly um, Asian, and they all had the bee on it. The, really? The rare bee. Okay. Because, but they were all Philadelphus, uh -huh. and I was looking at all the plants in that area, and there were no Philadelphus on anything, or uh, no. none of the, the Chalostoma Philadelphi yeah. bee that is associated with the Philadelphus on any of the other plants, even though they're literally just feet away. Hmm. So that's one example, and there's probably others. I'm not thinking of any mm -hmm. right now, but the general story is like, if you have a non-native plant, particularly if there's no close relative, and it's a system that has a lot of specialization in it. And maybe it blooms ignored. around the same time, yeah. you know, ish, you know, yeah. so. So it can be, you know, apple is a example of a plant, so, it's a rosaceous plant. Yes. So things like um, uh, cherry, apple, uh, Rosa. blackberries, <laughs> roses, yeah, yeah, yeah. all those kinds of things, they're what we call party plants. So they bloom for a relatively short period of time. Like a, um, a plant that wants and has developed a specialization, they bloom for weeks, right? Because you don't want to not feed your specialist bee. But uh, you know, like the sand cherries that I have out there, that's week and a half done. And so, um, but it's a very simple flower, like a child would draw that flower. Yeah. Very open, <laughs> pollen and nectar, easily available, no like weird chemicals in there. The basic story is like, everyone's invited, just come and grab it and I'll get pollinated, we're good. So when you have that, so apple, malice has, we have, um, have local apples, crabs, so the, the crab apples, yeah, the crab are, apples yeah. are native. Yeah. And so the bees are like, there is no difference here. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the cherries. So a lot of the cherries are not native, but we have a whole long series of uh, prunus or cherries from shrub to tree yeah. that are native, but again, they don't really differentiate. Yeah, as long as it's not like a double flower, probably. Oh, well, that's, we get into cultivars, yeah. game over, yeah. because you're never, like, no breeder goes, I really want a plant that has more pollen and nectar in it. Yeah. If you were the breeder, else. you would be breeding I those would types be of doing that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. But I don't know how you breed for that, though. You know it's what I mean? called, you um, breed for a um, crop plant. Yeah. So apples, cherries, anything that produces a fruit mm -hmm. has to be pollinated. That's true. Yeah. So it has to have good amounts of pollen and nectar. The bees yeah. are like, nope, go yeah. over there. So you'd, you'd say, I want that plant because it has the most pollinators on, and so I'm going to pick from that plant to pollinate with another one that has a lot of pollinators on. Yeah, I don't think they're quite at that level yeah, of like no. thinking it through. No. But uh, the failed cultivars of orchard plants just don't produce fruit. Mm -hmm. And it may be because the pollen and nectar stores were robbed. Mm. So when you're breeding a plant, like flowers, for example, let's think of begonias and all the pansies, petunias, those kinds of things, they, plant breeders asking a lot, you know, shorter stature, longer bloom, bigger bloom, all these kinds of things, but not asking for pollen and nectar. So where is that plant getting its energy? Mm -hmm. It's like, don't need this pollen and nectar anymore. Let's use it for bigger bloom. Yeah. So inevitably that system becomes less and less useful to pollinators. And again, if they're from a different country, the number of species of bees that are going to use that are much, much lower, low conservation concern. Um, it's like bird feeders, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, your budlia does get bees on them, but they're mostly honeybees, you know, just like your bird feeder gets lots of birds, right. maybe more than anywhere else in the outside wild, but mm -hmm. it's like house sparrows and starlings. Right. So well, maybe where's here. the good? <laughs> yeah. Well, you can get other things, but yeah. even like yeah. song sparrows, white throats. Yeah. Those are dirt point, ball species. Yeah, point taken. Yeah. <laughs> He's so cruel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love my buds and my buds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But all right, let's let's just drill into the cruelty part here. Okay. <laughs> all right. Where did that bird seed come from, Summer? Yeah, probably it was pollinated by some honeybee actually in South Dakota if it was a sunflower. <laughs> no, it came from the far western plains that are dry that they couldn't grow anything else but yeah. was native prairie. Oh, that's true. And then true. they scraped yeah, it so they could true. grow millet. But what about the peanuts? The peanuts, they love the peanuts. I always what about wonder the peanuts? about that. 
I There's still like somewhere, uh, somewhere there's I growing know. peanuts to feed to birds. Yeah, I notice he doesn't have any bird feeders around. I him. don't. Oh, <laughs> I have. I do. Look at this. <laughs> that's this a, is all that's bird our goal. feeders. That's our I have goal. tons of birds. <laughs> I can't. I help. question it sometimes. <laughs> I can't help it. Especially right, the I didn't mean to like, like drill into your little <laughs> private, you know, like safe space. <laughs> Sonder birds. Is, Sonder is correct in saying that we have to build out our our habitat as much as possible so that the birds could get their food in right. the habitat. Yeah. There we go. Look at that. Win-win. <laughs> you got to essentially make the property a bird feeder. Yes. By yes. planting so much stuff for them that yeah. they would love to hang out yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they uh, do. the they birds, do. birds will tell you if you're successful. Yes. We've found, we've found some really interesting birds. There's a lot of land. birds in our yeah. yeah. But I'm sure. They're probably coming for the peanuts, not the... Oh. No, not... We've had gross beaks. The first year we got there Evening was... Evening gross beaks? Yes, the first wow. year that we got there was a... What are those years called where they the Arctic species pull oh, up? Um, I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. An eruption. An eruption year, yes. Yeah. The year that we got there was an eruption year. Uh-huh, for and gross beaks. Not only for gross beaks, but for like... Um, what are those little... Siskins. Yes, we had pine siskins, yeah. and they were... Burrowing under the snow. I had never seen that wow, before. That's they were crazy. like they were like snow burrowing, and I was like, "Do they do that?" And I read, and they there is something to them burrowing in oh, snow. Oh, they bathe in the snow sometimes. They, they might bathe, yeah. but they were coming out of like these little burrows, hmm. and then they're taking ice baths. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wim Hof style. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, it hit the window, and it died. We now have things on our we have screens on the outside uh -huh. of our yeah, window, yeah. but it was a um, it might have been a fox sparrow. Oh yeah. So I think those are a little bit further north. We had never seen one yeah. in our... Well, they'll, they'll move south. So, yeah. for example, at the lab, we have tons of fox sparrows. Oh, interesting. But without a feeder. Well, we... Goals. <laughs> goals. Hashtag goals. <laughs> All right, so any any other thing that you could share with us about, like, our your, your specialist native pollinators kind of using your space in a way to kind of attract a bit more? Yeah, so I put in a lot of uh, different pollinator plants for some of the specialist bees. It's sort of um, uh, partially access, you know, mm -hmm. I have to find them. Sometimes I'll pull them from the woods and mm -hmm. grow them out or get the seeds. Um, but I have quite a number of different um, plant species here. I don't know what the exact number is, but I'm watching and trying to look at that list, you know. So for example, there's some of the shrubby willows, Yeah. Um, you know, and there's black willow right over there. Okay. Or over there is a better example. Yeah. And so the question is, so the both tree bloom. and herba herbaceous species, both trees and shrubs, shrubs and, and, yeah. and uh, herbaceous Yeah, I'm growing plants. a lot of different kinds of things here. Yeah. And then we do get really rare bees coming in. That's great. Um, to the same. We're in a it's pretty good corridor here. Well, that's what you're they, saying. You have like it. next to a refuge. So, yeah. you know, I think that's really positive. Yeah. And you're you're actually tomorrow giving a, a talk on forest bees. Right. So when, I, when you think about forest bees, are they really going deep in the forest? Are they living in the forest? Or are they just kind of more on the interstitial? Or All of the above. Okay. So one thing to think about is that if there were no disturbance, there would be the whole east from basically Maryland north would be nothing but woods Forest except bees. for <laughs> wetlands yeah. and maybe the barrier islands yeah. because there's no fire. There's no natural fire. Although like the the Native Americans were doing a lot of fire well, and cultivation. They're disturbance, yeah. yeah, and that's true. So yeah. um, they now we believe that they have been inhabiting this area for 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. So they were following the glaciers as they receded, but they were here during glacial maximum, right? So um, during that whole time, fire was their big tool. They didn't have bulldozers, they didn't have any iron. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but try chopping a tree down with a stone ax. Yeah. <laughs> it just does not work. Right. And so they just burned everything. They'd burn in the spring and they'd burn in the fall because that's when you could. In the summer, when you have lightning strikes, everything's so green, mm -hmm. it may go a little ways, but it's basically not, not generating uh, fire and therefore open areas from fire like they do in the south. Mm. They go to central Florida, it's, uh, there are fires all over the place yeah. all the time because there's so many lightning strikes. It's a burned environment irrespective of whether indigenous people were starting or not. Up here, yeah, the Indians were burning the heck out of the place. Colonists did too when they first got here. And then at some point people stopped doing it. And um, so now we have 
a very a different habitat, but um, you know that's only a twenty thousand year window when there were um, uh, Indians in the area, right? So mm-hmm. before that, uh, we had a long, long history of eastern deciduous forests, and you know it might be moving back and forth in terms of the location, and all these bee communities and plant communities developed in there. So in the spring, you way into the middle of the forest, you have a whole series of plants and specialist bees that are on just coming out of the ground. So they're gathering light when the canopy hasn't opened up. Spring beauty, claytonia, trillium, right. and blue bluebells right. and all kinds of things. They have their own bee fauna. Hmm. And um, and so once they're, those plants are done, then those bees are gone. Right. Uh, you Blood also root, Dutchman's bre- all those. Well, yeah, they right? all, and each yeah. has a slightly different. I just think of the architecture of Dutchman breaches yeah. versus blood root. Right. And you're thinking there's something going yeah, on. Yeah, Dutchman's breaches is a real. Who's getting up in those pants, you know? <laughs> yeah, queen bumblebees is <laughs> okay. a big one. And and um, a lot of those flowers are actually white. If you, um, a lot, yes. Some of some of the most like a, a lot of the trillium, gratiflorum, right. like the the, I'm thinking also cohoshes, right, the, right. the you know there uh-huh. a lot of them are white. That know, is not, interesting. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah. Um, so and we know from trout doing trout lilies yellow, you know trout lilies right. Erectum. But there's white ones too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We have a bad invasive problem with the. Uh, a lesser celandine, which is a ranunculus, which is yellow. Yes, we don't taking have, over. We don't have that where we are as much, or maybe we do, but we just I, we don't have yeah, it in our surrounding area. Yeah, might be area. coming your way. It's yeah. like trash this area. Hmm. And then the you have shrubs, sub canopy, and canopy trees that are all blooming, and depending on a lot of different factors. So a lot of those woody plants. So think of a more acidic forest where you have huckleberry and vacciniums yep. and um, mountain laurel, all kinds of things like that. But in a clo- completely closed canopy, they're mostly repressed. So when we go hunting for bees, mostly we're looking on the edges where some light is coming in and they have enough energy to produce enough flowers to attract bees. In the middle, they're just waiting for a disturbance. And here, naturally, it would be wind throw or a mastodon or who knows what <laughs> right. coming in there. Uh, but also logging and many other things can open up. Fires can mm-hmm. do that. Lightning strike, the tree falls down and the canopy opens up. Like, yes. Yeah. So um, also stream and river bottoms mm-hmm. sometimes have these gaps. So uh, the it's not a uniform system. Mm-hmm. And then some are canopy trees. So tulip poplar, black cherry, which tends to be towards the edge. But an interesting one is American chestnut, which is pretty much completely gone yeah. from forest, yeah. but it was a tall canopy tree and it was the last bloom in the spring, really early summer, in a forest. And then it, that forest completely shut down. Mm. So if you go into woods in July, there is nothing. There are no bees in that forest. Yeah, it's actually surprisingly quiet in forests, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? As far as like, even sometimes we go into like deep forests and you're like, we, we've even gone to some remnant old growth forests, uh-huh. and sometimes you're like, man, there seems to be so much more activity on, on the edge. You know? Right, right. <laughs> well, think about the edge has light coming in yeah. and more places in the middle of the forest is coming into the top. So there might be a bunch of warblers and vireos mm-hmm. up there, um, but in the understory, it's all just hunkered down. Mm-hmm. Like we're just, they're just waiting hmm. for next spring or some kind of, uh, you know, opening of the canopy so they can just, you know, explode. So the flowers follow behind. If there's not enough energy in the, for the trees, then they don't produce flowers and then they don't, um, you know, they're the bloom and the bees are not gonna be there. The difference with those trilliums and dogtooth violets and those things, they're up every year. Like they don't have a, it has to be a disaster for me to produce f- enough flowers for anyone to be interested. They simply are limiting everything to that short window of time between um, early spring when there are no leaves on to when leaves are on and they just pump through that whole thing. They have very sort of, they take a long view of that. So they put everything into a bulb 
and then they just wait till the next year. Mm -hmm. I'll mention one technique that I did a lot more before I put down chips. I sure. would just burn the whole yard. Okay. And um, they're like that crazy Sam. No, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's one, why the neighbor sold the land. He's like, I, I can't no, take this me. guy anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, they're they're very used to me. Um, but the um, one year it was getting late, and I thought, oh, I really need to burn the yard. And instead of doing like a little patch at a time, it's like I'm going to burn all of it at once. But your neighbor hates and you. Then, <laughs> they're so used to me. So everything was on fire, and then I realized <laughs> that I had put down some chip on some paths and it, it created a bridge between the burned area and this house. And then I all of a like sudden- I feel like this is something you might do. <laughs> all of a sudden the house was on fire. And so, and you know, don't do that. You're like that gif where you're sitting in the chair and the fire's all around and you're like, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I take a little more risk than other people yeah. <laughs> for these things. Well, this has really been fascinating. I mean, I think this gives it gives me, and I think a lot of the viewers will take away a lot of different management strategies that one could do. Yeah. I mean, even just like disturbing your forest a little bit and kind of like right. waiting things for things to come up. But this has been super informative. Yeah. I ahead. really appreciate this. You bet. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to the channel to help us grow the community. And if you have strategies that you're using to attract more of your specialist pollinators, be sure to share them in the comments below. We'll see you in the next episode.